Welcome back to Distant Signal and another episode of State of Play. This is the fifth entry into the hopefully forever series of episodes that we'll do here. And we're talking to Kent Bernhard today. He's doing a series in Kansas City, Missouri called Street Runners. Kent, what is Street Runners all about? So Street Runners is a crime drama. We've been working on it for about two and a half years. Uh, and it's about four low-level uh, street thugs who've, who are working with uh, probably the primary crime boss in Kansas City. And uh, on the night of uh, their first major assignment, of course, things go wrong. And uh, they end up being um, caught by the FBI and the main character is asked to turn informant. So it's going to explore the world uh, um, through the eyes of, of the FBI and, and the eyes of uh, this criminal enterprise and this guy who's stuck in between facing the pressures from both sides and trying to not get killed in the process. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we've been working on. It's been an, an interesting journey so far. Now, you told me, you've told me a couple times uh, and just a few minutes ago that the show ties in a lot of historical elements into the so, story. Yeah, so, so, so loosely based, like the, the main character is loosely based off of, um, to, you know, very loosely based off of a character who uh, really existed in Kansas City in the 20s and 30s um, named P Tom Pendergrass. And Tom Pendergrass was um, uh, a businessman. He had various degrees of, you know, various businesses that he did. One of them was uh, liquor and then bootlegging came in. He stopped doing that, um, got into construction, but really he ended up being like a... Uh, um, a small political figure there, but uh, used his powers to pretty much run the city and uh, pretty much ran everything from construction to the police to uh, to all the clubs and bars and nightclubs. He kept, he made sure that the city stayed open during Prohibition. So uh, as a result, uh, it uh, Kansas City never really went into the Depression. That's kind of where everybody went to... Uh, to engage in their, you know, debauchery or drinking or, or what have you. And um, Kansas City ended up with like a great jazz culture and a great uh, uh, cultural scene and, and ended up being very rich uh, during that time, but also very corrupt. And, uh, <laughs> well, so, I guess you got to take the good with the bad. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So um, what we're doing is we're taking elements of that, we're putting it in a modern context and saying, what if, you know, what if... Um, what if somebody uh, this day and age uh, with ill intent came into a level of power and tried to run everything? He was a smart businessman, so he, he runs the politicians. He's got pretty much dirt on everybody, and then from that he, he can kind of control it. So you've got the, in, these kids who are, who are stuck with him, or these young adults who are, who are stuck working with him, in a situation that's almost inescapable for them because they really don't have that many people that they that they trust and there aren't that many people even on the legitimate side of the law who may not be compromised by this guy. So, you know, it, it forms an interesting predicament. Why did you choose to do this story? Why Street Runners? Well, uh, I, uh, this was a story that came to me. So, um, uh, uh, Omega Edwards, who's my main character, um, created the original concept for that. By the way, Omega, that's just the best name ever. I, I met another guy named, his last name was Goldhammer, and I always thought Omega Goldhammer would be the best, the well, best, most masculine name. I'm, I'm gonna, possible. I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna talk to him about that. See if, see if we can change Omega that. Omega Goldhammer? I think if, if this doesn't go, wrestling for sure would. Okay, for good. Him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he had the original concept, and we've just been working on it and modifying it for the um, and flushing it out for the past couple of years. We've shot two episodes so far. Uh, the idea is that we do six for a season. We'll do a, we'll do a full arc. When is the next one planned to be shot? It's a really good question that I don't have the answer to. The, the ideal would be to shoot it within the next year. The, the, the super ideal would be to start shooting in September. Uh, when we did the when we did the last one, so we're we're just trying to put some of the pieces together, see if we can do it. One of the major advantages of being very independent is we can go start shooting whenever we wanted. And so, 
it might be worth you just picking up a camera and starting going to shoot stuff. Like even if it's just even if it's just exteriors and really sunsets and things that really just flesh out the character for for the for the show. Because I always yeah. I always noticed when I didn't have money, what I had was time. Right. And so instead of waiting for like these three days to go shoot, why aren't you continuously say building this as we go along with whatever you've got? There are certain elements that we are that we have been shooting with, and and B rolls one of them that we've been we've been picking. Up. So you are taking the opportunity um, to go whenever yeah. there's a minute to go actually collect yeah. something. So you do. Uh, I don't do it all that way because these are f- these are pretty big productions. When sure. when all said and done, I have to have a script ready and a sense of direction. And I find it's easier to do uh, that in a compressed amount of time because, you know, you're asking people to commit, you know, eight days of their life uh, instead of trying to piecemeal them all together. So I don't, so I can just get everybody together one time, do it, put it together and, and go from there. For me, just given all the moving pieces of it, it's easier to put it all together it, as as one film project and piece it over time and then worry about continuity and all those other things that, that shift and change over the course of the year. Yeah, that was one of the things that by letting go of from when I was doing Milkshake, especially when I was doing Milkshake, was... It made the th- it made milkshake better because I could I could look at the the one say the one evening that we shot and go and cut that scene together and say okay I have either screwed something up here or I've opened up an opportunity because I've done something better than I originally intended so next time when we go shoot I can really plan out the next two minutes instead of instead of having to plan out eleven or twelve minutes that we get in th- we have to get in three days it's like well we'll shoot a day here and then I'll cut it together and then I'll slowly build it so that I can I can more closely tailor it and I can I can and I can concentrate more resources on like a, a smaller bit of time because I could work and earn some more money and save up some more money and um, I could plan more and I, I, I can allow myself more time doing it the old-fashioned way which is how you're doing it is good because it, it strikes it's more efficient but yeah the one thing that I the one thing that you do lose is the ability to say oh you know what? I think we've got this is all we can get for today let's see how that turned out and then build on it next time yes well we've we do do that a little bit so like uh in in both episodes there were uh we put it together and there were uh opportunities we'll say opportunities to do reshoots that we could go in and we could fill certain areas that weren't necessarily getting the coverage that they needed and i didn't know that on the page it wasn't until we it's hard to know again. until you look at it and then you're like well that's not going to work that way so i've got to go back and and uh reshoot these these elements so that so that we can add a little bit more to it but i don't know what you're saying is is interesting it, it certainly sounds like a an unique organic way to go into um to filming um it would feel to me i think it would that would be one of those things where i'd constantly be uh my head would so constantly be in it that i i'd probably struggle a little bit more to focus on my other activities uh oh yeah we have certainly with milkshake right uh it was on milkshake all the time yeah yeah so you know uh, and you maybe even a little bit like this is you know i'm an independent television maker which wasn't even a thing it's kind of amazing uh, that that's yeah, a thing yeah now. yeah um you can start your own talk show and compete with the volume of viewership that networks get on youtube there's yeah, that's, some that's a little odd i, I don't know if i be well, competitive for that well i don't <laughs> but, i don't know, think i mean that's not what i'm yeah. trying to do here but i i think that it's just incredible that you can be an indie television yeah. filmmaker now yeah, yeah. A, and i think uh you know, it for me, it's. Uh, have you thought about? Sorry to interrupt. Have you thought about starting like a, a fund, not a foundation, or or a foundation, or a Patreon, or a subscribe star page to to build an audience so that you, as a television independent television producer, can sort of capture a small audience to pay you every month, like a dollar a month, to build a base so you can keep making your material. So initially, no was the answer to that question. Right now, I'm a little bit more interested in it i could see the advantage to doing something like that now whereas before i probably was you know i i I wanted to retain as much uh control and secrecy around the project as possible the film industry's changed so much we used to be you've got to keep everything super secret 
you can't tell anybody your idea for fear of it being stolen and or you copywritten away from you essentially or made and then you have to go fight some big corporation. But now it's, everyone requires a tremendous amount of access to you and your ideas at any given moment. And there's still some secrecy, like the big, big movies have a lot of secrecy because it's such a massive investment. But And I think anytime nowadays when you're dealing with an ind independent project, and this was probably even true, you know, uh, back in the 90s when a lot of independent movies were being released is, uh, you know, it's important to build a fan base. And, right. Um, but now I, that fan base is directly connected to you. Yeah, yeah. And this is all kind of new to me. So uh, the idea of, of going out and, and building an online fan base and getting people interested in the project as we're developing the project, as it's going, and organically trying to raise money that way... Um, seems like a unique kind of challenge that uh, I hadn't really considered before, but you know, the, the world's evolving. What I liked about Street Runner and, is that you are selling sort of, um, you're, you're selling a city? Yeah, cities, the city's a character in the, and, in the storyline. And with <clears throat> globalized filmmaking, there's, a, there's an, an effort to shoot in places that aren't the locations that, then to stand in for other locations like Toronto, like downtown LA always stands in for New York. And then you Kansas can start, City. yeah, Kansas City. You can start from like a very small niche audience who just loves Kansas City. Kansas City, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Kansas City. I don't know. It seems like there's a really unique opportunity uh, to build an audience locally with Kansas City because it is such a famous city that honestly does not get a lot of play yeah. uh, inside of Hollywood. It's a complete. It's almost like oh yeah, Kansas City is super famous for jazz. You've got major sports leagues teams there. It's a it's a metropolis. With these new ways of raising money, you could set up some kind of structure to keep making your show as an independent producer mm -hmm. with the backing of an entire community. I think that yeah. I think that's there's like yeah, a really cool opportunity there. Have you thought about ways of telling the story in a cheaper fashion? Like, um, let me give you an example. Like something like called augmented reality games. Have you heard of this? It's more like you start a, a, a Twitter account. The one that I can think of at the moment is called um, The Sun Vanished. And it started out a year of uh, October 2018, and it, the first tweet is help. The second tweet is the sun has vanished. And it's all about this. It's a first-person perspective story where the audience can interact with him because it's on Twitter and help him get through what is ostensibly an alien invasion that has blotted out the sun. And from the, the, the audience helps him get from point A to point B. Sort of like he's like, I've got to make a choice. Should I go down this road or this road? And the audience will say, go down the left road. It's so like, okay, I'll go down the left road. And so it's, this very, it's this, a very intimate storytelling that you can do. Are you, is this something that's being video? No, it, well, there's some video and there's some photos along the way, but it's, it's a tweet. So it'll be, he'll say something like, uh, the, the, it's an alien invasion. So it, he'll post, one of the videos he posted was, we had a lightning storm last night. Oh, I could see this in the clouds. And just ever so faintly, you could see this triangular ship sort of just floating across the skyline, which is a very cheap effect. Right. I, I can do that for nothing. Uh, but it's, it seems like Street Runner, there's a unique opportunity to do something, to do storytelling like that. Because I've never heard of anything like it's, this. This is, this is certainly um, an interesting approach to Story. storytelling. You could... Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is that you can continue telling your story from a first person perspective while you're working on the show. So that way there's like this continuum. So you can continue the story for months and then you can use those bits that the audience helps you figure out and incorporate those into the next script if you want. I mean, there's, a, there's opportunities that are coming, that are arising for storytelling that are just like nothing I've ever seen before. Hmm. Just, it just, it, I thought it would make a good opportunity because you have so many characters and so many storylines that you could follow offline and you can incorporate all the cool places in Kansas City that you could um, you really just explore the city with your characters. I think it'd be kind of neat. Yeah. Well, check it out. Like uh, check out The Vanished or The Sun Vanished on Twitter and you should check it out too. I think you'll actually okay. think it's really interesting. All right, I'll, I'll um, so I don't know. I'm just trying to think of ways because I obviously I'm an independent filmmaker as well and the resources that we can contribute to our projects are, are minimal. So I'm always looking at ways of being able to tell our story for almost no money. What, what, what is the way that we can convey the best and most amount of story for the least amount of cost? I hadn't done anything in the film industry in uh, uh, seven or eight years. So I was coming back on set kind of cold uh, and I was producing and directing at that point in time. So there was a, a learning curve that, 
that took place between the first and the second episode. And I think there's been an evolution on my part just as far as um, um, developing myself as a filmmaker and uh, the people I've been collaborating with, were, you know, the more I get to work with them, the more of a shorthand we can create. So it becomes a little bit, you know, you can build upon each episode, you know, so there's been a natural growth uh, that's been happening just as, uh, as a producer on my side. Um, you know, getting the, the tone right when we did the first episode, it was kind of, here's a setup, and it was a giant setup storyline, and I wasn't quite sure what the story was going to look like or the characters were going to look like. When I did the second episode, it ended up as a more complete story. It, it kind of had a cyclical element to it. Um, and I had had a year between the first and the second episode to just be in the world of my characters and go a little bit deeper. Well, now I've, I've had even more time to just kind of sit in that world and think about who my main antagonist is and what my protagonist is looking for and what ultimately the group wants to get out of it. And, you know, um, just in, in context of, of characters, there's been huge development. Um, so, so outside of money, it sounds like the, the, the biggest challenge you faced was getting back in the swing of things? In the first episode, yes. There, right. there was a... Okay. And um, then after that, the and, next And challenge. then it's just... So it's, it's figuring out the story, telling the story, obviously uh, getting back into the rhythm of, of filming and shooting and working with a production team again and preparation. Um, and then uh, from a story teller's component, you know, uh, being able to go deeper with those characters and figure out what that world's going to look like. And uh, I've already set up a format where I've got a half an hour to, to tell a story, how to, how to maximize that half hour, how to get the most out of that, and how to build from episode to episode to episode so that I'm going deeper. Um, and, uh, you know, this, as I go deeper, the stakes can rise and, and the interest and, and care of those characters will grow too. What do you think is the biggest missed opportunity that you had shooting Street Runners? Preparation. Maybe, maybe that was my biggest missed opportunity the first episode where it got better the second. And now that I'm looking at doing more, I, I, I'm like, I can see how. Yeah, you can tell too, between the first and second episode, the second one is much better. I felt like you definitely learned from a lot of your mistakes from the first one, as far as like coverage and conveying moment to moment what was, what was happening. It's a little clearer, or it's a lot clearer in episode two than then if I remember correctly in episode one, because it's been a while since I've seen both of them. But you can tell that you had much, you had more time yeah. Or you had, and you yeah, had and you had a whole had episode more, of practice. I had more. I had more time. I had more preparation. I had more time to to um, be with the character. There was a ready fire aim approach that we, we took. But sometimes you need that. Otherwise, you you sometimes I, can't actually move forward. With the I did for sure uh, to do it because you know I'm prone to drag my feet. You know, there's a fear that 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 uh, I think is intrinsic whenever you're about to do something that. Uh, is outside of your comfort zone and especially in my case something I hadn't done in a while whereas uh, in the first episode I didn't give myself uh, enough time to, to worry about that fear because I, I gave myself some pretty pretty aggressive deadlines and we ended up shooting and we ended up doing you know it, it was we I got the 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 product uh, done and, and we, we got a complete project out of it um, but growth came in the second one because I just, in the time it took to edit that first episode and um, the adjustments that need to be made and the, the time I was thinking in that world, I, I naturally as a storyteller was able to get a little bit deeper. And then I had more time with the script between the second episode uh, when, when I wrote it and when we shot it. And that made my preparation, you know, I, I had more preparation with it. I was able to clearly go into the shots and think about what I needed. I knew what was missing from the first episode. So, you know, I made a, a, a clear point to make a new series of mistakes the second time around. <laughs> well, there's always more mistakes to be made. Yeah, yes, yeah. But it's better to make new ones than 
repeat the old ones, you know, then you're yeah. growing. There's an evolution that's happening. Yeah, there. I agree. It's better that we're making new mistakes, but I'd rather just make less mistakes overall. You know, I think the thing that people don't recognize or people tend to forget is there's an organic thing that happens when you're making a film. It's, it's more than just a non-linear puzzle. There are things that are going to come up uh, within the shooting or within the story or within the characters or within the actors who are playing the characters that uh, need to be incorporated and and that can sometimes it can take you in a completely new direction or uh, sometimes you just have to adapt your story to meet whatever particular challenges have come your way um, so that the story can benefit by it rather than you know suffer for it you know if that makes sense at all so. Well, it seems like that the less money you have, the more organic you have to be about things because things are changing so often. Where I say with uh, the opposite is probably true. In fact, I think I, I know it's true with, say, movies like Ant-Man or The Avengers, where things are planned so far in advance that any kind of winging it is just not feasible because everything's so special effects heavy that everything is essentially decided long in advance of these decisions like the, the, the director well, yeah there's, there's definitely more of a produced element to those kind of things i but even said you know even those bigger projects on the day there's going to be some improvisation well, a little you know, bit things like that do happen and it does give you new directions but you can incorporate that into the arc of your story yeah. you know, if you see something really good in episode two you might file that away and that ends up in episode five. You, you've got a callback mm -hmm. or you've got two actors who were really great in episode two and, you know, further down the road, all of a sudden they're in scenes together because you know you've got something unique there and you can build the story into that. Um, and that's, that's kind of the fun thing about doing a series as opposed to, you know, a feature mm -hmm. is that you do have those kind of moments that, that, that you can build. You still need to know where you're going. You're not just ambling through the series. So what is next for Street Runners? We're gonna do a screening of it in Kansas City, probably uh, sometime over the summer. I've got two more episodes written and ready to go, so we're gonna be starting to put together a production plan for those. And who knows, maybe I'll just start one of those what would you call them the augmented reality the augmented reality page. games yeah Maybe i'll just start an augmented reality and and build into that and uh and i think that, that way I, that sounds like a really cool <laughs> idea so. i've been pondering making a whole youtube channel based off the tear for changelings and building out this whole cosmic horror world and i thought one of the things that i could do with it would be to do an augmented reality game um out of it and have a twitter channel that's tied specifically into the world of the tear uh -huh. and and just begin building that universe and then eventually launch a youtube channel but i'm not i'm not sure if i want to do it yet only because i think i might have the same fears swirling around in my head that you might which is do i really have the time to think about this other character every day while I'm working full time and trying to get changelings done. And it's like, it, there's so much as an independent producer you have to do that it becomes overwhelming very quickly. Yeah, I, I you know, that's, that's my thing. And I think if you're gonna do something like that, you've gotta be consistent with your audience. You know, they've gotta be able to know that they're gonna get new content uh -huh. on a regular basis or, you know, they're gonna lose interest in you just like everything else. So, uh, but it's still a really good uh, idea. All right, so. Can't tell the people where they can find you. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Kent Bernhard, or you can find me on Twitter at Kent Bernhard. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for stopping by for this latest episode of State of Play with Kent Bernhard. These will be coming periodically. There's no schedule yet for these. I've got to get more subjects in, and hopefully that'll happen soon. But in the meantime, keep checking back for Changelings. The 36th or 37th entry are going to be up today as well as the Changelings crowdfund run-up continues until april 21st when the crowdfunding begins that's it check out kent's social media below enjoy your weekend stay dry and i will see you soon thanks for watching if you like what i do here hit that subscribe button find me on steam and support me on bitbacker for only two dollars a month worth of bitcoin or bitcoin cash you'll get exclusive content early access to everything i do and access to my private telegram channel where you can ask me any question you like about the process of making changelings with cryptocurrency. All right, see you there.